In this talk, I want to introduce you to the electrocardiogram. You should first look at basic cardiac electrophysiology before viewing this. We cannot record the SA nodal electrical activity on surface electrodes. It's much too weak for that. However, the SA node then triggers the atria to contract. The electromyogram produced by atrial contraction is visible on an electrocardiogram. This is followed by AV nodal activation, which is then followed by ventricular action potential, which I discussed in the electrophysiology talk. If we look at this on an electrocardiogram, we see the atrial contraction here in green is seen as the P wave. Ventricular contraction is seen as the QRS up through the T. Repolarization begins the T wave. And then we're back to rest again. Now, one thing to remember is this is one myocyte action potential. There are many, many action potentials occurring in rapid succession, producing the Q, which is usually the septal depolarization, the R wave, in which most of our ventricles are contracting, and then toward the end we see the S wave. By the end of the S wave, all cardiac myocytes are contracting. And at the beginning of the T wave, we begin to see ventricular relaxation until the end of the T wave back to rest. Why is there such a long plateau phase, the ventricular action potential? That is to inhibit tetanus. We do not want another action potential to occur before the ventricles have completed contracting. So we hold the membrane potential above threshold, keeping it in its absolute refractory period until the ventricles have finished contracting. Now we can relax and trigger another action potential. Let's look a little bit about DC and AC current, because to understand an action potential, we need to understand filtration. A DC signal, and I've got here just starting at zero, and then I suddenly change it to about five volts, hold it there for a while, bring it back to zero, and hold it there for a while. If I run that through a high-pass filter, what I'm going to see then is this. When the signal is not changing, an AC signal stays at zero. As soon as I see a change, we see an increase in voltage on the AC signal. But since it's no longer changing, the AC signal doesn't respond and drifts back to zero. Now the signal drops again, and we see our signal drop to minus 5 millivolts. But since there's no change, it drifts back up to zero volts again. If we look at a ventricular action potential, we see it's a DC voltage. We start at zero, it jumps up, it's held high, and it falls back down. Not very different from our DC signal here at the top. If I run that through an AC filter, I'm going to see this. In other words, no change, we're at zero. A rapid increase, we see a spike, returns back to zero because the AC filter, depending on the cutoff frequency, sees little or no change, it returns back to zero. Now, during the repolarization phase, we see the T wave. But why don't we see the T wave going down? It's, according to this, we should see the repolarization triggering a negative or inverted T wave, but we don't. Now, let me explain that. If I set up these three cells, and I've got an amplifier here, and I depolarize here in red, the signal, it's going to pass through gap junctions to the positive electrode, triggering a positive deflection, an upward deflection. If that follows a repolarization on that same cell, and it also moves toward the positive electrode, we would see a negative or downward deflection. Repolarization is the negative of depolarization. This is what we would expect to see. However, what we see is depolarization coming from the endocardial cells, the inside near the chamber, moving toward the epicardial cells, toward the positive electrode, we get a positive deflection. However, the last cell to depolarize is the first cell to repolarize. So now the epicardial cells repolarize in a direction toward the negative electrode. Two negatives cancel one another, and you get a positive or upward deflection, in other words, a normal T wave. Depolarization goes from endocardium to epicardium, and repolarization goes from epicardium to endocardium. 
we have a very slow conduction system called the AV node between the atria and the ventricles. All electrical activity must pass through the AV node if you have a normal heart without an auxiliary pathway. This allows the atria to finish contracting before the ventricles contract. Slow down the entry of the signal to the ventricles so the atria can empty into the ventricles before they contract. Now once you pass through the AV node, we go right back into rapid conduction down the bundle of His, down the bundle branches across all of the Purkinje fibers spreading around the heart to activate the the ventricular myocytes. But each of the ventricular myocytes can activate its neighbor because they have gap junctions. So you don't need one fiber for every muscle cell. All you need to do is to activate one muscle cell and that muscle cell will, through gap junctions, trigger its neighbor to contract. So we have a rapidly conducting system bringing the electrical activity around the heart and then the muscle cells that contract stimulate neighboring muscle cells to contract. So you get one big contraction, virtually simultaneously. Now we're looking at the dispersion of electrical activity, the SA node, atria contracting, slow down through the AV node, ventricles contracting, and relaxing. And if we look down here, we can see the atria contracting, there's our P wave. Ventricles contracting, QRS, stay contracted, now relaxation, repolarization, back to rest. If we look at a 12-lead system, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we measure things. We have this grid work, and if I blow up four of these, we see that each of these major blocks is about 0.2 seconds, or should be exactly 0.2 seconds, or 200 milliseconds. There are five small blocks within one of these major ones. Therefore, one-fifth, or about 40 milliseconds for small blocks. The height of one of these large boxes is a half millivolt. So when we send through here, as you can see, a one millivolt calibration signal for about 200 milliseconds, we can now check the calibration of our signal. We see two boxes high, one millivolt. We can measure the rate by measuring the R to R interval. In this case, I happen to come over here and I see two that are nice and exactly four large boxes apart. One, two, three, and four. That's 0.2 times four is 0.8. We take 60, 60 per second, divided by 0.8 seconds, gives us 75 beats per minute. Another way to look at this, if the R waves came one large box apart, that would be 300 beats per minute. Two large boxes apart would be 150, 3, 100, then 475, which we just looked at. There's another way to count rate. If you have a system in which the rate is not uniform, for example, in atrial fibrillation, where each RR interval is different from the previous one, we can actually take this rhythm strip. This is a 10-second strip and count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and probably 13. 13 times 6 and you will get approximately 75 beats per minute. Well, the other thing we want to look at here is this QT interval. From the Q wave here to the end of the T wave, we call that the QT interval. But the QT interval changes with heart rate. So we need to correct it for heart rate. So we take the QT interval and correct it so our measured QT is divided by the square root of that RR interval. Now, if the RR interval is one second, the QT corrected is the QT. In other words, we're trying to correct it back to 60 beats per minute. Once it's corrected, we want to look for a QT interval of about 0.36 to 0.44 seconds, less than 450 milliseconds. Long QT intervals can lead to ventricular tachycardia or torsades de Puens. I'll leave this up here. There are 14 steps in evaluating EKG. You can look at this. Different cardiologists use different steps. I've seen eight steps, I've seen 14 steps, and I've seen them in different orders. In a previous slide, I discussed the corrected QT interval and implications of a long QT. There are a couple of other intervals, however, that are important. One is the PR interval. It should be between about 120 and 200 milliseconds. 
a short PR interval could indicate an accessory pathway, whereas a long PR interval indicates an AV nodal issue. The other is the QRS interval, or sometimes just referred to as the width of the R wave. That would be this width in here. Long width R waves could indicate an accessory pathway. The way I review it is to look at this. I look at the rhythm and the rate first. I look for a sinus, non-sinus rhythm. Is the rate normal? Is it a tachycardia or bradycardia? Are there premature beats? Is there atrial fibrillation, flutter waves, re-entry loops, AVNRT or AVRT, delta waves, ventricular tachycardias, conduction blocks, etc. Then I march through the electrocardiogram from P all the way to U. Look at the P waves. Is the interval long, short? Is it variable, indicating a second degree AV nodal block? Look at the morphology. Are there hidden P waves? Are the absent P waves indicating atrial fibrillation, which I mentioned in the rhythm? Are there inverted P waves? For example, an inverted P wave in chest lead V1 indicates a left atrial enlargement. Then I look at the QRS. What about the width? Do I have a wide or narrow QRS? The voltage. What is the electrical axis of the heart? And I do have a discussion on calculating mean electrical axis of the heart. And I look for prominent Q waves. The Q waves are too large. That's an indication of a, an old myocardial infarct, an old heart attack. Then I go to the QT and the ST. Look for the QT interval. Do I have a long QT interval? Look at the ST segment. Is it elevated or depressed? Am I looking at an ST elevation or STEMI or an ST depre depression or non-STEMI? Then I go to a T waves and the U waves, if there are any. Look for positive or negative. Is the T wave upwardly deflecting or downwardly deflecting? Is it inverted, in other words? Look at its morphology. Are the U waves present? Then I go to the chest leads and look for R wave progression in the chest leads. That is, the RS ratio should increase from V1 to V6. And I've got an example here. R is very small here. It gets very large up in here. And then in the end, you want to list your findings. You want a summary of your interpretations. And if you have an older EKG, you want to make a comparison. Is it the same? And is it different? And if so, what caused the differences? Well, that concludes this talk on basic electrocardiograms.